to another episode of Beyond the Stable. Today, I'm joined with a very, very exciting guest. It's Flo! Hello, I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know you, Flo, or hasn't heard of you, do you want to give a little bit of background on yourself? Yes, okay, so I am an eventer, a content creator, a university student, I've evented up to two star and kind of delved into the world of social media because I wanted to share the highs and the lows, so that's kind of my niche is that you know, doesn't matter if the day goes yeah. well or if it goes badly, you will get the same length update from me, which, you know, <laughs> is not always the most natural thing to do, but that yeah. is kind of, yeah, that's what I do. And we're filming in a very nice location. We're in Loughborough, where you go to uni. We're actually in your uni flat. Yeah. Do you want to speak a little bit about uni, what you're doing at uni? So I am actually doing history at university and I get asked a lot, you know, why history, what yeah. is the relevance to anything else? And it's kind of the fact that there is none. I <laughs> really like to have a bit of a different avenue. My yeah. whole life revolves around the horses, especially with all of the content creation mm -hmm. work that I sort of do. So I love it, having a completely different sort of avenue. I'm in my final year. I'm just a few months off of graduation, <laughs> which is kind of both kind of exciting and ready to yeah. break, but also a bit scary because that means that adult life is looming. But yeah, I, I've loved, loved my time at Loughborough. Yeah, how come you picked Loughborough? Was there any reason for picking Loughborough? I didn't have it on my radar. Originally, I wanted to go to King's College in London. Okay. And I went to look at it, and I just thought, wow, I can't see myself in London. <laughs> you know, I am kind of a country girl at heart, always yeah. have been. And this just feels like a very big step. So kind of went back to the drawing board, reevaluated, mm. went and visited a few universities. And Loughborough was the standout. I mean, it's kind of the biggest, like, green campus yeah. in the UK. So there's so much space, so much opportunities to get involved with sport and different activities. Mm -hmm. And... Also the course, I mean, that's kind of the boring part, but the course yeah. is, uh, is, is what I enjoy, so. How are you finding your course? Like, do you think you'll do something with history when you leave? I don't think so. So for a long time, I thought I'd probably use my history degree to then go and train and become a solicitor. Okay. And in the last year or so, I've had a bit of a change of heart. I don't think I'm ready to leave the sort of a question world yeah. behind just yet. I just love it so much, so... Yes, I think my history degree may not be used, but also, again, a bit boring, but there's so many transferable skills from it. Yeah. So in some ways, I probably will use it. Yeah. Let's speak about the horsey side of things then. So you've just filmed an, ep an episode or a couple episodes, a series? Yeah, I was involved in a series. With yeah. Horse and Country TV, which is absolutely amazing. Like, so well done. Like, that is so <laughs> cool. Um, do you want to speak me through, like, the behind the scenes? Like, how did it come about? Like, take me right back to the start. So it was actually quite out of the blue. I just got a message asking if I might be interested in mm -hmm. being in the next season of Back to Basics, which is all about training and taking things back to the very start. And essentially it's for people of all levels. Yeah. So they've had a few series. They've had a dressage one, a cross country one, and they wanted to do a pole work one. Mm -hmm. So I was asked if I might be interested in that. And obviously <laughs> I very much was. It was one day of filming and it felt in between my so I had basically a semester one like final year exam mm -hmm. filmed for a full day and then had my other final year God. exam for university <laughs> so very full on date wise <laughs> it was kind of crazy but it was just an amazing opportunity mm -hmm. um my horses were you know they they lived up to the whole being honest thing because did one, you take both of them I took both of them yeah and I got to film I think it was three episodes with both mm -hmm. um and one, Atty, behaved himself very well. The other got very, very excited <laughs> and did not behave himself. And it was a little bit of a humbling moment. But it's, again, it's horses. Mm. I'd actually taken him to a pole work clinic the week before we filmed because I wasn't sure how he was going to yeah. be. He gets very excited when he sees the poles because it makes him think he's jumping. <laughs> and he was really good in the pole work clinic. So I was like, oh, nothing to worry about. And then, yeah. Got them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So you were just filming for one day, so you didn't stay overnight, you were literally just there and gone. What was it like having all the cameras and stuff on you? Obviously you're used to having the cameras, but I imagine their cameras are a lot bigger than your vlogging camera. A very different scale, very fancy equipment. Yeah, it was, it was different. I think that the vlogging has definitely taught me to kind of be able to tune them out. Yeah. So it was quite easy, especially with Atty who was behaving, to just kind of get on with it and imagine that I was just being coached like in a normal session. Yeah. When Star started to be a little bit silly, obviously you're like, oh my goodness, this is happening. I've got three massive cameras <laughs> on me. You know why? But it's, 
it's just what it says. When's the series coming out? When can we watch it? It's actually just come out. It's come out? Yeah. So right, you guys, you it. need to get on that. <laughs> Go watch Flow on Horse and Country TV. It was, yeah, a really quick turnaround, actually, a month between filming. Yeah, I was going to say, I only seen it on your Instagram not that long ago that you were yeah. filming it. Yeah, which is also really nice for me to have kind of filmed it and then quite quickly see it and yeah. while it's all still fresh in my And mind. have you watched, is it all out or just a couple episodes it's out? It's all, all out. out. I've watched a couple of episodes. I haven't seen it all yet, um, but I'm definitely going to be going back and using the pole whip exercises that we did yeah. because she had the the whole point of it is every exercise used only six poles okay so when that's I quite first, nice for like people to take away and set up at home because not everyone has 20 poles at yeah. home and when I first heard that I thought gosh well there won't be much you can do with six poles there is so much <laughs> a you lot. can do with six poles <laughs> you know when we'd have a layout on the floor I would go right I see she wants us to go straight through it that way or something and then mm. she'd add about 10 ways I hadn't even thought of yeah you can that's go so good across here or do this or transition through this so yeah it's it was really useful and I will be using them <laughs> and you live here at your flat with your boyfriend yes what does he think about you being on horse and country tv i do does he <laughs> get it or does he not get it because like for me that is so cool yes does he find that cool so i feel like it's not exact he's really into his cars so it's not okay. like me coming home and being like i'm going on the grand tour he would be like wow <laughs> but he is super supportive and yeah i think he i think he was quite pleased um for me so that's yeah that's yeah. amazing and what does your mum and that think about my mum loves it my mum is like my biggest supporter i'm yeah. so lucky to have her with me every step of the way and actually logistically the whole week was a bit crazy because I had my exams as I said mm-hmm. but also we filmed at Wellington Riding which is a lot closer to where I'm based at home when I'm not okay. at university so we essentially brought the horses home for me to sit my exams and film this and then they came back up so that I didn't oh miss God. any more yeah. lectures so my mum bless her probably did six seven hours of driving in that oh week yeah, you know, up to get them back actually it would have been more than that um just to accommodate so yeah. she is amazing but I also think that she does really enjoy going to yeah doing it and all. seeing the behind the scenes of it all so yeah, yeah I can't wait to watch the episode <laughs> I'm sure you absolutely smashed it I hope so <laughs> I'm sure sure you did um earlier well last year now I was gonna say that earlier this year but it's not it was last year you were at London International Horse Show you were on the live zone speak me through that that is honestly one of the most surreal pinch me moments like mm. in my whole journey with equestrian sort of social media i have been going to london international especially when it was formerly um olympia for yeah. years and years and it's like the highlight of my sort of like christmasy calendar yeah. you know it just gets you in the christmas mood christmas so good. horses what more could you possibly want so to have that opportunity mm-hmm. it was like I can't put it into words how amazing it was. So I went and I hosted the live zone for two days, turned up and the live zone was about three times the size it had been in previous (laughs) years. So when it had been like kind of a a small, nice little stage in the corner, it was suddenly quite big. And I was like, wow, I've got to stand up on there. (laughs) And, you know, some of the very first sessions I did were really big, popular sessions with influencers Mm. like Harlow and this Esme. And, you know, the crowds were packed. I had never presented to... A group of people that big before yeah. so it was it was incredible a learning experience and just amazing how did that one come about did they just message you for that one yeah so I had a few opportunities earlier in the year that mm-hmm. I think probably put me more on the radar the radar yeah like eight nine months ago I hadn't done any presenting work at all mm-hmm. so you're such a natural at it though. <laughs> are you like media trained or anything no, no I think the vlogging helped a lot yeah I don't naturally think that I am the best public speaker um I used to get really nervous mm-hmm. for school presentations that sort of thing you would never think that <laughs> ever you're so good at it that's so good but I think the vlogging has helped because it makes you comfortable speaking to a camera for extended periods of time. Yeah. And especially with kind of what I do, the event vlogging, a lot of it is one take. You know, you're walking back from a dressage test and you're doing a debrief. You don't really want to be seen in public filming that five times. Yeah. So it's it's one take. Um, and that makes you just a lot more natural and comfortable kind of talking. Just so, doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You said when you were speaking through that, you met Harlow and this says me. What was it like meeting some of those people kind of you've watched online and then finally getting to see them in real life? It was great. And the bonus of the presenting work is I quite often got to ask them some questions at the start. Mm-hmm. So I get to, you know, talk to them like up close and personal and ask them the questions that I want to know, which is great. 
So it was it was lovely. I'm lucky that a lot of the people that I interviewed throughout the week I sort of know, um, and that was you know it's nice to kind of catch up with friends, yeah. Millie, Meg, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was it was great, and the range of people I got to speak yeah. to was just incredible. Yeah. And how does it all work? Like, do you have set questions? Because I wasn't lucky enough to go this year. Is it audience questions? How did it work? So it depended sort of session on session. Yeah. Especially if it was like a meet and greet session, then quite often you know, there was a lot of people to get through in quite a short space of time. So I would go on stage, introduce them, ask a few questions, and we'd go from there. But some sessions were more sit down chats. So an interview, I'd come up with the questions, obviously run them by, make sure that everyone's happy with them. And then quite often we'd have 10 minutes or so at the end for audience questions, which I also think is great because when asked, you get the chance to speak to your favorite influencers Mm -hmm. and ask them the questions that you want to know. And obviously I can come up with questions that I think people want to know, but people might want to know different things. Yeah. So it's, it's great. I love that element of a little bit of both. Yeah. hundred percent. Do you get nervous before you go out on the stage? Yes. I think that's something that I, yeah, I'm not afraid to admit. I think Mm. I do. I think for example, by the Sunday afternoon, I was pretty chill, but especially that very first morning when, you know, I sort of pulled back the curtain and was like, okay, that's oh the most God. people I'm <laughs> ever going to have spoken to. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of nerves, but good nerves, exciting nerves. Yeah, because when I, I seen clips and stuff of it online, obviously, and it was packed, like the audience yeah. was full, like, people were standing around <laughs> yeah. the back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, not every single session was that full, but yeah. some of them were, yeah, really? were insane. Who was the fullest session? Uh, Probably... This has May or Harlow yeah. or possibly Meg. Yeah, they were yeah. all really, really, really busy. Cool. Yeah. How do you get rid of those nerves before you walk on stage? Do you have like a pre thing that you do or just I hope and pray? Maybe I should. <laughs> Maybe I, that's actually a good idea. I should probably come up with a way <laughs> a little to try ritual. And, yeah, no, I think for me it's about being really familiar with what I want to say. So yeah. the better that I know about someone that I'm hoping to talk to, the better and more confident I feel because when you're comfortable talking about a subject, it's a lot easier. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So good. And you've done lots of other bits and bobs like that as well. What's been kind of your favourite one that you've kind of hosted? Mm. I think London probably has to be the favourite. But I have... Close second? (laughs) Yes, it's a very special place in my heart for the Pony Club Championships because that's the first thing that I ever did. So I have been in the Pony Club for years and years. Mm -hmm. I am like the biggest advocate for it because it gives young people the chance to compete not against professionals, yeah. which especially in eventing, as soon as you're kind of going to 100 level or beyond is, you know, you're against the pros. Mm-hmm. So Pony Club Champs has been a highlight for me for years. I've gone and competed there since oh, I was probably 14. So yeah. if you told 14 year old Flo that she would be kind of hosting <laughs> a session there, she would, wouldn't believe you. Yeah. Um, but the whole way that came about, I was going to host a sort of Q&A session with Ella and Molly Cook, who are sort of show jumping content creators. They're mm-hmm. on YouTube, they're on TikTok, they're on Instagram. And I got there and essentially very last minute, there was a change of plans and Piggy March, the five star yeah, I've seen on your Instagram. winner, you know, <laughs> badminton rider was, was there. And they were like, right, you know, could you just interview her as well? And at this point, I hadn't done any presenting work yeah. and, you know, Piggy March would probably be one of my eventing idols mm-hmm. and I had nothing prepped and I also had to juggle, you know, the dynamic of having two show jumpers yeah. and an eventer Eventer. and making it work. And then obviously because Piggy was there, the audience was getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And I had about sort of two or three minutes to kind of get that all in my brain and go, right, we are really going to give this a go. <laughs> And it was the most exciting, but also kind of like high pressure, you know, I don't want to say stressful, but crazy experience. Yeah. And I think that that was what pushed me to realize that I want to do more of it because mm-hmm. if I can, you know, if I can do it with no prep, then hopefully with a bit of prep, I can do yeah, it. Yeah, you're doing okay. that. Yeah. Um, so that's got to be probably the most like surreal, amazing experience. Yeah. And you've done lots of it. So who's been your favorite person you've met? Um, so Piggy would be up there, but actually on the second day at London, I think it was the very final slot, I had the chance to sit down with Gemma Stevens, formerly mm-hmm. Gemma Tassel. So she's not only an eventer, but she also competed in the Puissance at London International this year. And that was really cool, especially because 
I felt that we just had a really nice chat and there were so yeah. many things that as someone who's really interested in the sport I wanted to ask her about and I got the opportunity to and mm-hmm. she was just so lovely to chat to you know she really expanded on every answer and you know had a really good time and by the end of it I almost felt like I wasn't interviewing I felt yeah. like I was just having a chat and that was that was really nice really nice Okay, so you are also a two-star rider, Flo, which is amazing. Do you want to speak to me how you got into horses and how then you worked up to such an amazing level? Yeah, so I, trying to remember back to the very start, but I think... <laughs> what age were you when you started riding? I want to say seven. My mum might be there going, no, you're wrong. <laughs> but so I, is your mum horsey as well then? Is that how you got into it? She had a pony when she was little. Okay. But she stopped it when she went to university and she hasn't really ridden since. So she is horsey and in that sense, she is amazing because she has the knowledge, which I think is really helpful when mm-hmm. you're a young person trying to get into it. But she was definitely never the one who was like, you must have horses. Actually, if anything, <laughs> I think there was a bit of resistance. Yeah. So I learned to ride in a riding school. I did my time of having lessons once a week for five years. And she really wanted to know I was dedicated and serious yeah. before we made that move. Um, and then when I was in year seven, so the first year of secondary school in the UK, I got my first pony. And yeah, that's that was how it kind of began. What was your first pony like? He was not a first pony. It's the the best way to put it. He was absolutely lovely. He was gorgeous Palomino, Mm -hmm. 13-2. um, And I wanted to just do the pony club, a little bit of dressage, show jumping. I had no aspirations to event at that point. Yeah. I went and tried him all the way in Wales. We drove all the way over. I tried him. (laughs) I fell off when I tried him. Oh, God. Because he... You still bought him? (laughs) (laughs) He's He's spooked. And yeah, I just went out the side door and that basically set the tone for the next, I think we had him for two years and he was cool. He, you know, when he went out and he Mm. um, show jumped or, and he would do a bit of dressage and he would do it really, really well. Yeah. But he was so spooky out hacking, doing whatever. And obviously for a first pony, I wasn't always prepared for that. So I learned how to fall off. Like I did it (laughs) day in, day out. I actually think once I went to a hunter trial and fell off three times in one oh, day God. which you wouldn't be allowed to do now but they let me get back on and I fell off again and they let me back on <laughs> so that was a very humbling experience um probably didn't help any desire to go eventually yeah. I was like never mind did that not knock your confidence at all I think do you know what if it happened now it undoubtedly mm. would but I would have been 12 13 14 at the time and I think I was just so happy that I had a pony yeah. because I had wanted it for so long that I didn't even think that no. you know, it would knock my confidence. It was just like, okay, that's part of it. Let's get back <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah, amazing. And then when did you take your step up to horses? So I'm trying to think. For me, things didn't really get super serious mm. until I was doing my A-levels, which is the perfect time <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to get, get serious. Sport. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I actually like kind of always thought I'd probably give it up when I went mm-hmm. to university I think that's quite a natural progression yeah Not a lot of many people, people, people juggle the horses with university and it was in I want to say probably the, the summer of year 12 maybe into the start of year 13 so my very final year at school that I was long listed for the under 18 sort of youth regional championships okay and through that I guess it really sparked the competitive side of actually maybe I can do this with you know some success and I stepped up to novice that year which Mm -hmm. is you know set out of the grassroots range and again was sat on a horse atty that I don't think anyone was really expecting would have success at that level and it went a lot better than we sort of first expected and that really fueled the this is a good thing. I'm not mm-hmm. sure whether I want to stop this just now. So then I had the conversation with my parents of, I know I've applied to go to Loughborough. I know I have a place this September. How would you feel about me taking a gap year? And they were super supportive of yeah. that actually. And then my gap year actually took place like a few months in is when COVID hit. Right. So then it became, okay, I'm not sure I want to go to university when it's full COVID. Everything's online. Mm-hmm. You can't leave. You're sort of like flat. How's the second gap year looking? <laughs> like, mm, 
is this your way of saying you don't want to go to university? <laughs> but they were, they, you know, as long as I was doing something constructive with the time, yeah. they were like, that's fine. So really it was the final year of school and the gap years. And since I've been u- at university that it's got a little bit more serious. Mm-hmm. And then how did we step up to kind of like bigger eventing? Like now you're two star, like when did that jump happen? So I think as soon as I was at Novice, I had that goal. Yeah. Because at the time, that was the lowest international event in the UK. We do now Mm -hmm. have one stars, but at the time, they were just a thing of the future. And I knew that before I sort of stopped eventing, which, you know, again, uh, a lot of these points I was assuming would be when I went to university, Mm -hmm. I wanted to say that I'd competed at an international competition. It was like a big thing and I really wanted to do it. And I suddenly felt like I sort of had the, the horsepower to do it with Afi. Um, we were never going to be topping the leaderboards. His yeah. dressage is probably not going to challenge some of the fancy two-star <laughs> horses. But I thought, I'm on a horse that could eat up that cross-country, and therefore, I want to do it. So my very first attempt was at the end... Oh, no, at the start of my first gap year, just before COVID hit, September okay. 2019. I went to south of England to do a two-star short format. Did the dressage. I think I was about second or third last. And then I thought, oh, well, at least that's over. And we went and camped in the lorry overnight and it rained all night. And we woke up at about 5 a.m. to a notification saying that it had been cancelled. So we went home and I was like, (laughs) great, you know. (laughs) And then obviously COVID hit and I was, you know, competition was off. And then I think it wasn't until 2021 that I gave a stab again. And we went for the under 21 two star long so quite mm-hmm. a big jump from a two star short to effectively a youth championship track yeah and that probably goes down as one of my most nervous moments like as an eventer i was about sixth or seventh in the start box and at the time i was in the start box no one had come back yet at least like not without stops that people had fallen off it had stops the track mm-hmm. was causing carnage and i was going I'm on a horse that's never done a two-star before. <laughs> you know, have I made a huge mistake? I've yeah. never felt nerves like that. And he went out of the start box. I rode really badly for the first few fences and I just thought, do I put my hand up? Is this too mm. much? And then we got to the tricky combinations and he just came alive. And he was incredible oh, amazing. and amazing. And we came home with a 20 on our card, which I think a lot of people will have gone, maybe he's not a two-star horse because he had a 20 and he had, I think he had four poles on the mm. last day. But in my heart, I was going, that's me. I'm sat on a two-star horse. And it wasn't until a year later that I got to kind of right those wrongs. We went to... Cornbury two star short and Osbyton two star long in pretty quick succession Mm -hmm. and he did two more clear rounds cross country and two nice show jumping rounds he had a pole in each and I finally felt like I had ticked that massive box that I'd kind of been chasing for at that point you know three years of proving that I'm sat on a horse that is incredibly talented yeah and now you've got you've got two horses now, is that yeah. correct? Do you want to speak about the other one a little bit? Yes. So Star is probably slightly more complicated. He's, Star is your grey, isn't it? Yes, yeah. he's the grey. Atty's the dun. He is incredibly talented. Mm-hmm. And he is one of the most amazing jumpers I've ever sat on. He puts up with me and the fact that I don't always <laughs> see the best tries. I'll just be real. And um, the other thing is he is going to make every effort to leave those poles up in the show jumping which is somewhere the atty's a bit like i'll jump it if you put me on a good stride i'll jump it clear but not that fast whereas star is very much like those poles are staying up so my journey with him has been a little bit slower because we got him right sort of before covid so what was the decision in getting him did you just want another one is there something different you wanted to do or so it was the gap year thing it was the fact that I decided to take this gap year and I wanted to focus a lot on the horses yeah and it was a bit like if you have the gap year to focus on the horses and something happens to your only horse where yeah, do you go you've what? just got a year <laughs> there's nothing good to report about that <laughs> so it was again like immensely grateful to my parents because mm-hmm. the decision was to get star bring him into the fold and the idea was kind of that the two would go alongside each other yeah um but yeah, got a little bit slower to get going because COVID hit and then he had a bit of an injury and he was off for six months to mm-hmm. a year. So I'd seen little snippets of what he was capable of. Yeah. But I don't think I'd really got like the full thing until probably summer of 2022 when he came back from his injury. And summer 2022? Yeah, I think summer 2022. And 
it, it, ever since then, it's just been like going from strength to strength. So we finished that season by coming third at the B90 Open three day yeah. down at Bixen, which was incredible. And my first stay away show with him and he's, he's quite a character. He was quite nervous, I would say. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't sure how he'd fare in that atmosphere and he was brilliant um, and, you know, ate the roads and tracks up like there was no tomorrow. And then this year we set our sights on the new Agria B100 League, which was run a great concept for amateurs who could go around different events run by BEDE Mm -hmm. throughout the year and accrue points. And we were doing quite well because of the dressage. (laughs) didn't count it was you were <laughs> pointed basically throughout all of the main sort of qualifiers your points were based on your jumping okay. and like i said star is the most honest jumper he loves it it's what he lives mm-hmm. for so we got to the grand finale which was the one star at osbyton yeah and we were at the top of the leaderboard <laughs> and i was going wow i didn't expect that yeah um so the one star at osbyton was a huge step up for both of us you know, as a partnership, because it's a long format dressage test with all of those tricky movements, you know, the mm-hmm. leg yields, the mediums, um, it's long format, the cross country was longer, the fences were bigger and more technical, and the dressage went horrifically, it's all out there on my YouTube, <laughs> you can go and watch it, it went really badly, and my only goal going into it, which I thought had been, like, kind of setting the bar quite low, was to, the score to start the three, for it to not right. be a 40-something, which, you know, that season we had broken the sub 30 barrier we've been in the 20s at mm-hmm. a couple of points so i thought that is a, that's a fair goal no we got 40 points something oh, <laughs> he no. had a bit of a meltdown it didn't go very well and i thought okay well at least the bad luck's out of the way and actually all we really i thought we had to really do was to finish at all and i thought we we might yeah. stand a quite a good chance of winning or coming to the top went out cross country He was so strong. I think it was the environment, the temporary stabling. I I don't know what it was. And it's something that we're still sort of trying to work out and get to the bottom of. But I went out the start box and I was like, oh, I do not have this horse where Mm -hmm. I want him. And we were quite late on in the day. We knew that the difficulties with the course were fences sort of four and six. So very early on. And it was causing big problems. Like I think a third of the field had a stop at fence four. So I'm right. coming down to fence four, not quite with the control that I want. And it was like, I don't know how to describe this, but it was like those angled brushes where right. one half is jumpable and one half is not because the brush yes. is so big. And I line him up for the first one and he jumps the jumpable part and then he just plows through the non jump like he oh, jumps God. straight over it. And I'm like, mate, <laughs> you're making your job harder than you had to be. <laughs> We got down fence six, which had been causing massive fear among riders. And I thought, we might do this. We've done the hard part. Mm -hmm. Got to the first fence of which I'd said, if I get to fence seven, like, we might be okay. And I fell off. (laughs) And it was the water. I stayed dry, but I fell (laughs) off about two meters from the water. Just had a bit of a misunderstanding. It was Mm -hmm. really shadowy. He chipped in. I wasn't where I should be. And I fell off. And I was absolutely gutted because I felt that I'd let him down. Still to this day in the three seasons we've been eventing together now he's never stopped at cross country events when we're out going and he didn't then he just had an awkward jump and i came off um so i was pretty gutted because i felt like the league that we've been working towards the whole sort of year that that had maybe gone down the drain we actually found out quite shortly after that that he actually ended up still winning it so that was like like a cherry on top of the cake but also (laughs) yeah um and now i would say that i that's kind of I want to be back with a vengeance I want to go and do a one star with star and prove that we can do it yeah so you've bought two horses you've been quite lucky by the sounds of it with the horses you've bought yeah like they sound they're amazing I've seen them all over your Instagram they're so nice horses um have you got any tips for people buying horses oh because it's such a difficult thing to do it and is, it's a bit of a touchy yeah. subject as well yeah it is it's really difficult and I I have to say like I'm not jealous of anyone who's in the position of buying, buying. horses because I as as amazing as it is when you have your new horse at home the whole process before that is really emotionally very intense I yeah think, and trying them all like, and like, yes yeah I think that did you try a couple yeah Yeah. so with Atty we actually tried one and I really liked him and my mum was like it's the first one you've tried you know let's just go and look at another one and if you still think Mm -hmm. that he's right you know we will we'll get him and I think she thought he wasn't right, but I thought that he was. So I didn't really want to go and look at another horse, to be honest. I was like, why? We're going to miss out on this one. And 
I found one that was really, relatively local, Atty, rung up, went to see him, got on him almost with the mindset of I'm ticking a box so that I can go back to the horse that I tried, you know, last week that I really want. Mm-hmm. And I probably sat on Atty for about two minutes and I was like, this is the one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, like just clicked. We felt yeah. super comfortable. Um, yeah. And, and with Star, we were looking for a very long time. I think when it came to Star, a few years down, like had passed and I knew exactly what, what I wanted. wanted. And I think that would probably be my advice for people looking for horses is don't be afraid to, if you get on a horse, I got on, I think two horses and I was on them for five minutes. I walked and trotted and I went, I'm really sorry, this isn't for me. No. I didn't want to waste their time. I didn't want to jump a horse because often when these horses are for sale, they are in quite a lot of work because people are coming to try them. If it's anything like the market was at the time, it's a flurry of people wanting to yeah. see these horses. And a couple I just got on and I just went, this isn't right for me either, you know, not the right feel, but strong. Um, or I just thought, yeah. So don't be afraid to do that. And I also think um, the second viewing is a tough one because I know some people don't, like second viewings because they're worried that the horse is going to go but i think a massive indicator is trying a horse at home and then if you have the chance to try the horse away from home especially if you want like an event and you can go Mm -hmm. and pop them over some cross-country fences makes a huge difference because horses act very differently at home and away from home and i think that's something that is really useful for making informed decisions so those are kind of the things that yeah are important for me when trying horses did you buy privately or did you buy from a dealer Privately, and actually, for Star, we went all the way over to Ireland. So oh, amazing. Was... Speak me through that, because that's so fun. <laughs> so, when I decided that I was going to take this gap year, mm-hmm. the decision was quite quickly, okay, let's grab another horse, let's get another horse in the mix, and really as quickly as possible, because, again, gap year, the idea Make was the that I'd be going to uni, and yeah. we didn't know how long it would sort of be going on for. And we looked from probably the April before my A-levels, and we got to... October so six months Mm -hmm. and we had a couple of failed vettings we had a bunch that weren't right and we're like what do we do how long before we decide no it's too late to get another horse um so yeah the decision was to go over to Ireland to did you go with your mum yes went with my mum of course yeah she would not trust me to go there (laughs) by myself um and tried a few horses on that day it was the most manic day because we had flights in the morning, flights in the afternoon, mm-hmm. and then a schedule to try and like see as many as we could, which when they're quite far apart, isn't actually that many. Yeah. And yeah, I think it was also a really good experience because I tried three or four in one day. And so I had that direct comparison mm-hmm. and I knew that it was, you know, it was probably Star that I wanted. Yeah. yeah. What was the, was the market out there different to here? Like price wise, what you get for your money? Did you find it was different? Yeah, I think, I think it was. I think this was all pre-COVID. Yeah, I think so it could have The changed. market is very different now. Yeah. But when I, when we went, yeah, it was, I mean, it sort of had to be to make the flights, the time, the higher car all worthwhile. And I'm glad I did it. You know, what an incredible experience to have gone yeah. over to Ireland. It all actually feels a bit like a fever dream now. Because yeah, like I, I always think about it. it. Like, I'd love to just go over, try lots, like, yeah. and just see how it goes. But yeah. I feel like it's quite a scary thing to do. I think And it then is. you've got to deal with getting them transported over, and it's just extra layers of stuff. It is. <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. It's, it's crazy. And it wasn't our first port of call. It just, it made sense because of where we were at. We needed to change things up. And yeah, I wish I was vlogging back then because I yeah, I would love to watch that. I'd started like my YouTube journey before I'd really started much social media at all, and I just think that would have been such a cool thing to yeah. have, for, even just for me, because it does all feel like some weird fever dream that kind mm. of didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, no, that is absolutely amazing. Would you recommend doing it? Yeah, I feel like I'm asking this question for myself. Like, sh- should I <laughs> should go I to Ireland? <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends what you want. Like, I have loved an Irish horse, Atty's Irish. Yeah. So it definitely helped with you know get to go over to Ireland to see a star. Mm-hmm. I'm partial to yeah a good Irish horse. I think that when you get a good one, they are so honest and they love what they do. So yeah, I would recommend yeah. it. You'll have to you'll have to have one of those. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about your past and what you've done which is all amazing. Like Your career <laughs> is popping off with all your presenting and your horses are amazing and you're a fantastic rider. You. What are your plans for 2024? Gosh, so 
it's it's an interesting year for me because I graduate in a few months. Which time. is so exciting. It's very exciting. It's also quite scary. Lots of questions are being thrown at you at the minute, I can imagine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where do I go after uni? What's the plan? All of that. And I think because of all that, it's all kind of wrapped up with I'm I don't have crazy plans for this year. Mm-hmm. I'm very much gonna see what comes at me. Yeah. Um, obviously I mentioned earlier that I would quite like to get back and do a one star with star mm-hmm. I feel like I have kind of some unfinished business there yeah um, so that would definitely be on the cards as well as that I went to the pony club championships last year which you know I touched on earlier how much I love the pony club mm-hmm. and they have a brand new class which is kind of replicating long format eventing it's called the chairman's cup it's at a really great level for me of between 100 and kind of like novice it's like 105 right. which means that both boys can do it and that's a great feeling having two boys in a championship class together so yeah again if I could qualify for that again that would be amazing but I think also Atty's getting older now he's yeah. 17 which I feel like a lot of people who follow me online maybe don't know and no I, th- I didn't realize no, that he was that kind of age because I feel like he doesn't show his age no. <laughs> he's quite he is quite low mileage before we got him and because he, he loves it so much mm-hmm. he's always got the enthusiasm but I also think that with a horse who's done so much for me I have a duty to kind of go out at the start of the season and see how he feels and not yeah, to make to any him. crazy plans um but at the moment he is absolutely going strong so <laughs> no signs of his age absolutely loves it um I had a very keen jump session on him yesterday in which I actually decided to keep the fences quite small because I was like you're a little bit too excited for me today <laughs> so yeah amazing and then going into doing this one star on star yeah <laughs> um what is a piece of advice that someone's given you that you'll take into that one star who's given you and that why is that your favorite piece of advice that you've been given oh gosh okay that's a big question I feel like, and I think this can go more broadly than just for the one star, but my mum's always very big on just doing it for you. Yeah. And I think that kind of goes back to the two, the first two star I did with Atty, walking Mm -hmm. away with 20 penalties with four poles on the last day. And like I said, I feel like a lot of people maybe thought that he wasn't a two star horse and all of that. And I knew in my gut that he was. And I think it's the same with star. Like I know that he is so capable of doing it. And I think you've got to block out any kind of noise that suggests mm-hmm. otherwise and just have your your eyes on, you know, you know your horse is better than anyone else and you've got to believe in yourself and yeah. have that kind of faith and confidence. Um, you know, sometimes I think I have to look at the people around me, mum, dad, they're so supportive and I feel like they have the faith in me and yeah. sometimes I'm doubting what I'm doing and I think that, yeah, the best advice is to not doubt what you're doing. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, you've got to do you. It's your life. Yeah, just go for it. <laughs> just go for it. Um, we've talked about your social media a little bit. I want to speak about it a little bit more. Yeah. When did you start your social media? So I think that the timing for me was quite fortuitous because it was going into my first gap year. It was mm-hmm. all kind of part of this. I never had crazy plans to go traveling. Like a lot of people would do a gap year and they, you know, want to go to Southeast Asia or yeah. Australia. That wasn't it for me. I wanted to do the horses and I wanted to work. And so I thought, what's a third component to that? You know, just to really make sure that I'm, you know, making the most of it. And It was coming off of the back of my 2019 season, which wasn't bad by any Mm -hmm. stretch, but it was that season that I was long listed for the under 18s and wasn't selected, um, went to the two star and it got rained off and just a few little bits like that. I ended my season with my first kind of like, I think I had two run outs and that was the first run outs I'd had all season. And I was feeling a bit flat in the winter of 2019 and also feeling a little bit like, why is no one talking about this? Why, mm-hmm. when we're on social media, do we see everyone's highlights reels? Do we see their happiest days and their best achievements? And yet, I know that you've gone out to these events and they haven't gone to plan and there's radio silence. Yeah. And I feel like I almost felt a bit resentful. And then I was like, hold on, I do the same. You know, mm. I am the same. So uh, that was where the idea was born. Let's start a social media sort of page that is you know it's the real the whole package it's the youtube and the instagram and Mm -hmm. it's the vlogging of where i go and let's you know post whatever happens in the same amount of detail if it goes badly as to if it goes well yeah and that was the inspiration for it and i think that i got quite lucky that 
I had a little bit of content out there before COVID hit and obviously COVID, you know, for all of the awful effects was brilliant. For Prime people. time for socials. Yeah, sat at home having more time and I think a few people discovered me in that period, which mm-hmm. I was super grateful for because once I had made that commitment to myself, I said, I want to yeah, be really transparent and honest. I almost didn't know what I was in for because the first event that I ever vlogged and I have vlogged every event that I've done since March 2020 when I got out to one before COVID right the way through to, you know, here in uh, where we are, March 2024. <laughs> I have, yeah, I've vlogged every single eventing competition I've done, which is crazy. But the very first one, the very first dressage test of my first vlog mm-hmm. was the worst dressage score I've ever got. Star wouldn't canter. It was really muddy. It was horrible. The cross country was right next to the dressage. Mm. It was, I think, my second ever event with him. So it was a very unknown. And yeah, I came out like almost, almost in tears. The score was so bad. It was like 45, I think. And I was like, maybe I just start being honest tomorrow. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not right now. And then I was like, no, that's the whole point of what you're doing. So it went up, it's out there online, it's awful. Like, the the (laughs) vlogging capabilities and the dressage test. But I think people appreciated that because when they were sat at home a few weeks later in lockdown, it was like, oh, here's someone that's, you know, not showing her glossy finished highlights reel. And that has been my message from day one. I love that message. (laughs) That's so nice. And then it's obviously grown over time and you literally put videos out every week. Like, you're so on it with, like, everything. (laughs) Um, have you got any tips for anyone who's looking to start social media? Yeah, I think that I think that when people are asked for tips, there's quite often the same few things come up mm-hmm. and they are important. You do need to be consistent. You know, you do need to have a real passion for it and not do it because you think it's going to go anywhere. But I also think there's some practical advice. And the first one is find your niche. It's a growing yeah. market. You know, all social media is. And I feel that I... I'm probably quite lucky that I started vlogging, you know, before too many people in the horsey space were doing it. Yeah. But um, find your niche because that's what's going to make you stand out. And I think for me, it was that whole honesty thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that's completely niche anymore. I think a lot more people are doing it. But if you have something that makes you stand out from the crowd, you're going to have people returning to look at your content again. Yeah. And that's what you need. And the other thing is kind of linked to the be consistent thing is do it if you really want to do it do it for say six months before you check in with the results Mm. and see where you're going because it is so easy to be disheartened but yeah I was doing it for I don't know probably a year and a half before I even reached a thousand subscribers on YouTube Mm. Uh, you know you've got to do it because you really enjoy it because if you're doing it for like the numbers and stuff yeah you won't have the passion to get through it because it won't, you know, it just won't go zero to 100. It's unlikely. Yeah. Amazing okay. advice. Okay, Flo, what has been your favourite horsey memory? Oh, I mean, I could say there are so many. One that comes to mind straight away is crossing the finish line of the cross-country phase of Osberton Two Star Long. So that's not even completing it because the show jumping was on the final day. But knowing I'd just jumped around a two star long clear. It's one of those few moments that I feel like I could just really bask in it. I think I'm the kind of person that achieves a goal and almost doesn't fully celebrate it because I'm looking at the next goal. Yeah. And that was very much a moment of no, this was just pause what a second, I've been take it in. Yeah. And I was able to do that. And yeah, I honestly, I pretty much cried when I came over that finish line. I had my mum there, I had Dan there, I had the wonderful Rochelle who's been a massive help to me whilst the boys were at uni and I just felt like I had everyone around me who was so supportive and so Mm -hmm. caring and obviously the most incredible horse who had just, you know, like jumped his little heart out for me. That stands out as just a moment where I could, yeah, take a breath and go, wow, that was cool. Yeah. We've got a follow up with the worst (laughs) one. So uh, I think what's funny is if you roll the clock on a literally exactly a year from Osberton Two Star Long, I was at Osberton One Star falling off on Star. And I think that whilst now I can really laugh about it, and obviously I still actually went on to win the Agria B 100 League, which I'm super grateful for, mm-hmm. in the moment I felt pretty rubbish. Not even so much for the fall, like I was okay, I wasn't hurt, and I was really grateful for that. But the weight of being in a leading position in a league 
I haven't had that before. Yeah. I'm quite often, we come from behind because our dress size isn't so strong. And I'd never had the feeling of going into something with that kind of pressure. And those, mm. that hour after it happened, the feeling that I'd really bottled it, that I'd let Star down because actually he still jumped the fence. I just didn't stay on. And also knowing that almost we jumped the hardest parts of the cross country course, yeah. that was that was pretty, pretty crushing. <laughs> But you've vlogged all that. It's all out there on YouTube. You can see my raw <laughs> reactions. You can see my mum, because my mum was stationed at the fence before I fell off. And you can see her running down, thinking she's going to get the very end of yeah. me uh, jumping the fence. And Is this the one where she's she like, Flo, sit up, sit up? So that wasn't my mum. That was oh. a lovely lady who was actually crossing steward that day. And she was filming. And I'm so oh, grateful that. that she has the footage, because otherwise I wouldn't have the yeah. footage of the fall. Um, and I walked over afterwards and I had to use her crossing point to mm -hmm. um, to get off the course. And she was like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Was, <laughs> but yes, it is. That is the moment that you're thinking yeah. of. And it is amazing that you vlog it all and put it all out there. Because like you say, a lot of people just wouldn't. Like, they just put the best bits out. How have you found, like, doing social media now you're back at uni? Like, is that scary to you? Like, having people at uni watch your content potentially? Yeah, I think so... One thing that I do is all of the university equestrian. So mm -hmm. I do a lot of the riding, the teams, and I really recommend that to anyone who's yeah, going Yeah, I've seen that. It looks really good. It's great, even if you don't have your own horse to get involved. And obviously, those guys get it because they are surrounded by horses and stuff. But mm -hmm. also, you meet loads of people, especially like in halls in first year, who aren't horsey. In fact, they've never sat on a horse before. And even before the whole vlogging content creation thing, they don't get why you would do it full stop. Why are you not going on this night out so that you can wake up at 5 a.m. and go and jump around the show jumps yeah. in the freezing cold and rain? They don't get it. And then when you find, then you're trying to explain, oh, and also, like, I film, I film all this it stuff. All. <laughs> they really don't get it. And it is something that I struggled a little bit with at first because not everyone that I met along the way, you know, really understood it. Some people mm -hmm. thought it was quite funny. Not in a bad way, not necessarily like at school where I imagine some people have had a really tough time, but just yeah. a slight sort of, you know, we're above this kind of thing. Yeah. But actually, I think one of the big takeaways I've had from uni is that the people that you stay in touch with, the people that, you know, make the effort with you and the people that are meant to be your friends for life, get mm -hmm. it because they get you. And the people that, you know, yeah, don't probably aren't the kind of people that you're going to spend the rest of your life seeing anyway and therefore it doesn't really matter that's a really lovely mindset to have how do you implement that mindset so for someone maybe at school or at uni and they're really struggling they're trying to get into the content social media world and they may be getting bullied or it's not going too well for them like the people around them aren't supporting them how have you got any advice on how to power through that it it is a lot easier said than done i think that's absolutely fair um but I think it's having the courage in that if it's what you want to do, then it shouldn't matter what other people think. And like I said, it's so yeah. much easier to say that than to do it. But I think most people will find that they have a network of a few people that do get it and are really supportive of them. And actually, it's funny because the same people that maybe in my first year of uni had a little bit of a laugh. Like I said, it was never anything horrible, but just didn't really get it. And now the same people going, how did you get that presenting role? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it's like, wow, <laughs> if you hadn't laughed at me. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's it's yeah. Be confident and be you because if people can't appreciate you for, you know, who you are and what mm -hmm. you want to do, then they aren't meant to be in your life. Yeah, 100 percent. Okay, so this podcast is called Behind. Oh my god, I can't even say it. <laughs> beyond the stable. Um, I want to know what you do beyond the stable. So, what you do outside of horses? Maybe another hobby, or what you like to do for fun that's not horse related. Okay, so and I know that's a hard one because you're a very busy person because yeah. you're at uni <laughs> and literally you vlog in that you've got horses like so much <laughs> and so much of my life is horses. Yeah, like ninety plus percent of it. And actually, it's something that I took a step back, sort of last year I think when I was in the height of kind of my second year of my degree which was actually quite stressful alongside eventing two horses mm -hmm. and I did sort of say what else it what is, else is there that I do what else is part of flow and when I kind of found that there wasn't loads I was like right let's think because it's not actually that healthy when a lot of what I do is the sort of social media -y content creation to yeah. be doing that and then also doing that for leisure because you don't really fully switch off. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I started doing, which if 
like for those people who follow me especially on instagram they will know a little bit about but if not i'm about to sound like a very odd woman <laughs> is i read a lot i I, have <laughs> I read probably for half an hour every night before i go to bed and beyond the fact that i actually really enjoy it it's so healthy for me to yeah. switch off from screens um you know for a set piece of time before bed every single night be switched off from the world of mm-hmm. numbers likes analytics statistics you know all that kind of stuff and i yeah i'm really happy that i started doing it it's not necessarily it. an impressive hobby it's just something i enjoy yeah have you got any book recommendations for anyone oh that is hard i think i've had a few friends come to me recently saying they want to get back into reading yeah and i've always said i feel like it's something that everyone wants to do if they don't do it you want to do it and you have to find the right books because i didn't read like i used to read a lot as a kid and then i stopped going through school because Mm -hmm. the books that they would make us read were wouldn't enjoy them and i feel like most people are in the same boat so you've got to find what you like and for me i like a good rom-com yeah (laughs) you know i'm not claiming that it's anything super intellectual so you Deserve Each Other by Sarah Hogel. That's a recommendation for anyone who wants to get into it or anything by Emily Henry. Um, Happy Place, oh, for example. <laughs> love that. Um, okay, I have a little dilemma for you. Okay. Got okay. some pressure. So I'll tell you what the title of this dilemma is and then we'll dive into it. So the title is, How Do I Break Up With My Loner? Have you ever loaned a horse? I haven't, no. no. Okay, so you can have to put <laughs> yeah, yourself yeah, in that mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I've had my horse on part loan for the same to the same girl for two years. My horse and the girl have a really good bond and have really progressed together over the years. That's pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> However, my loaner has started to get sloppy with the yard work. The issues are small. For example, she stopped taking the wee out of the bed and only skips out. I don't deep bed my horses and I've always taken everything out. She doesn't clean out the water bucket and she just tops it up. When doing the horses in the evening, she's meant to fill up a hay net and put it so I can put it in in the morning. However, she's stopped this. I've pulled her up on these issues in the past, but nothing has ever changed. I know that the problems are small, but I no longer want her to loan my horse. Um, as the point of loaning is to like take yeah. away the time of that, isn't it? Um, so yeah, what does she do? How does she break up with her loner? That is that is really tough. Um, but ultimately, end of the day, your pony is your responsibility. And if I guess like was mentioned in there, if you're loaning it, you're loaning it. You know, you got to get it's like got to be something in it for you. If you are yeah. doing more work than you would have been doing if you weren't loaning it, then it's not a, mm-hmm. a helpful situation i mean my first instinct would always be to have the conversation yeah but maybe in this sense it needs to be the conversation with a little bit more this is what's on the line put you know put her aside and go look i appreciate what you've done over the past few years your bond with the horse all of that which is why i'm giving you the courtesy of this conversation to say Mm -hmm. I really want you to keep learning the horse, but it's not going to work if things aren't improved upon. Because at the end of the day, that is horse well-being and welfare, and that is so important. And I think if after that things don't improve, then you have to have the conversation, and it won't be a fun conversation to have, but your horse is probably more important than someone's feelings if they aren't looking after it properly. So say the lady has raised the issues and whatever, and nothing's changed. Mm. What are you then going to say to the girl? Are you going to text her? Are you going to speak to her in person, phone call? That's really hard. I think text would probably be wrong. Um, Maybe like a phone call or face-to-face. And actually, situations change. And that's the thing is, if you don't want to be brutal about it, you can always say, actually, look, I've got more time on my hands and I, you know, I feel like I, you know, I want the ride back, all of that kind of thing. Or you can be honest and say, look, I did try to warn you i've tried to give you the courtesy um but it's my pony's welfare and that's the most important thing I'm not saying i'd like to be in that position yeah. <laughs> i'm glad that i'm not <laughs> um it's probably a lot easier said than done but at the end of the day we love our horses because they're our pets and if you're worried that you know they're not being taken the best care of then yeah that's you, you shouldn't feel bad for yeah. making that kind of decision when you went back to uni with your horses did you ever think about putting them on part line or anything like that to help with that because obviously quite a lot along yeah, with uni. Yeah, yeah. I think I've been really sort of transparent like throughout my whole journey online that when they were at home throughout my gap years, in fact, ever since I owned my first pony when I was 12, 
everything I've done completely myself. Every morning mm-hmm. I skip them out and I ride and I poo pick and then, you know, turn them out, muck them out again. You know, it's all, it's all been me. And that changed when I went to university. Yeah. I'm really lucky that I have help with the yard because I think my parents realised that I wasn't going to be able to take my degree super seriously um, if I was also, you know, spending both ends of the day around the horses. I was going to be missing lectures. It was all just going to be too much. So I am incredibly grateful to my parents for that kind of support mm-hmm. because financially I couldn't have put myself through uni with the horses with that. It just wasn't yeah. an option. Um, and because we had that conversation sort of quite from the get-go, no, I wouldn't really say that the the sort of loaning conversation necessarily came up. It was more of a, you know, am I doing this? Am I going to uni with the horses or am I selling them? Yeah. Okay, so as you know, we are traveling up and down the country. Yes. Um, speaking to lots of different influencers, professionals. Have you got anyone that you would like to see on the podcast next? Oh gosh, that is because there's so many people. Obviously, I'd love to see some some more eventers on the show. Yeah. And maybe some professional eventers. I've loved having the chance to actually like interview and chat to some of them before, mm-hmm. and a lot of them have a really interesting story to yeah. tell. Um in terms of influencers oh that's that's tough obviously you know that i get on very well with abby we came to your first yes. ever event harmony events together and i think she'd also be a great person to chat to so influencers we're going abby who are we going for for the professional oh okay i'm gonna say Gemma stevens because she was my highlight to interview and i think she'd be amazing on the podcast oh amazing <laughs> well thank you so much for being on the podcast thank you so much for having me it's been a blast it's literally flown by it has. <laughs> yeah it's been great I, it's been so fun for anyone who is uh, watching, make sure you go to Horse and Crunch TV, check out Flo's Back to Basics. I'm so excited to go home and watch it. I'm literally going to go home <laughs> now and I'm going to go watch it. Um, if you haven't seen Flo's YouTube or anything, make sure you head across and watch that as well. Um, the vlogs are amazing. Like I say, she is so on it. Like, <laughs> so consistent content out all the time. Um, and guys, if you have watched this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, make sure you're liking. If you listen to it on Spotify, make sure you're leaving us a review, preferably like a five star review, but totally up to you. Um, and yeah, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. <laughs>